Uh, good evening, and welcome to the Trinity Horn Winter Lecture. Thanks for all coming out. Um, I hope the room is of adequate size. It's suddenly looking like maybe it's not, but I'm, I'm sure we'll, we'll fit in. Uh, in a moment, I'm going to introduce Charles Handley, who's uh, kindly agreed to speak tonight on the subject of the shape of life to come. Um, once Charles has concluded, uh, and we've had an opportunity to chat with him, uh, there will be drinks and canapé served at the back of the room. So those of you not rushing off, then please stay on and, and, and please let's chat. Charles has been a lot of things. An oil executive, an economist, a professor at the London School of Business, the warden of St. George's House in Windsor Castle, a broadcaster, and the chairman of the Royal Society of Arts. I hope I got all that right, Charles. But of course, we all know him best for his books, which have sold millions around the world. And I guess, certainly for me, that, that's, that's how I know him. Writing primarily on the changing shape of organizations, work, and life in general, Charles will widely be regarded in the UK as one of Britain's leading business thinkers. I'm delighted to introduce uh, an award-winning author, social philosopher, and a source for me, at least, of ongoing insight, Charles Handy. Thank you, Brennan. Um, Brennan promised me an evening with some of the brightest and best of British industry. So I feel duly privileged to be here with you. Um, some of you may have looked at that title and thought, ah, he's going to speculate about life, life with outside, outside the European Union, or life in the decade of zero growth, or life in the age of the riderless car, driverless car, and technology does everything for us. All interesting things which we could speculate with great delight, but none of us could actually influence. So I'm going to talk about the life that you can influence, your life, your life to come. Now, as you know, the French have traditionally divided life into three parts, learning, working, and living. And when they did that, Learning took 15 years, and work took 50 years, and living was five years if you were lucky. When Bismarck introduced the first state pension scheme at the end of the 19th century, he fixed it at 65, because that was a normal life expectancy, so he wouldn't have to pay out anything. <laughs> the life has moved on, as you know, but not that much in some ways. I mean. Fifty years ago, when I joined the Great Shell Oil Company, they, they promised me 40 years of exotic life with them if I behaved myself. And uh, after 40 years, um, by which time I would be 60, I could retire. But they said, don't be too excited. The average length of retirement for ex-Shell executives is 18 months. <laughs> but they said, as a result, our pension scheme is very large and your widow, should you have married by then, <laughs> will be rich. And indeed, uh, it, people, my father died 18 months after he retired, and, and so it was. But now, now, it's roughly 20 years of learning and 40 years of working and 20 years of living, with a bit of overlap <coughs> and a bit of mix, because I think that... Uh, you're still learning while you're working, I trust, and maybe even still living a bit. And you certainly should be working while you're learning, because I think all learning <coughs> should require some working. So there's a bit of overlap. Um, but the thing is that the, the first bit, learning, has a, a definite structure to it, which we may or may not approve of, but there is a structure. And work has traditionally had a structure. But we're so unused to the 20 years of living that it has no proper structure. We don't actually know what to do with it when we get to it, or even where we're going to have the money to live on in it when we get to it. So I want this evening 
not to structure it, but to suggest some ways of thinking about it before you get to it, so that you have time to prepare for it. So the first thing that I tend to ask people to do, and I, I don't know if you've ever done it, is to draw a line to illustrate their life. A line from birth to death, I say to them. And uh, to mark up with the cross where they are on the line. And, and so most people, most people do this very quickly. And I say, hmm, pretty boring life, actually. <laughs> and secondly, I said, look, you're, you're 45 years of age. Actually, you've got another 40 to 45 years to come, but you seem to have gone over the halfway mark. You know, have you really thought about how much life you've got left? Or do you just think that it's going to go on as it is and then suddenly, actually somebody did actually put the cross there. <laughs> which got me a little alarmed about the coffee break. Uh, maybe I wasn't so interesting as I thought I was. Um, but then I say to them, look, come on, uh, think about it. Think about it, your life isn't just a flat line. And so they do think about it, and, and they ponder and a bit, and then they start drawing a line, well, sort of like this. And what, what they've done, though they haven't thought about it, is they, they've actually drawn a graph in which this is, this is time, and this is what? What do you go up and down on? Something like that. Something like that. Success. Money? No, it doesn't work that way, does it? Um, and that's a very interesting question. The other, the other interesting thing is that all the lines that I've seen drawn like that always end up, the last bit, going up. So it can't be money, can it? <laughs> and it can't be work, can it? You know, all those days of the office that you wish you had. So what is it? It's probably satisfaction or something. I actually go back to my old chum, Aristotle, uh, who philosophized quite a lot about the good life. And he said it was eudaimonia, which is an interesting Greek word, which is usually translated as happiness. And I think Thomas Jefferson, when he, when he wrote the American Constitution and so on, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, was thinking of Aristotle. But I don't know how well he knew Aristotle, because Aristotle didn't mean lying on the beach with a beautiful man or a beautiful boy and a bottle of wine. He, he meant something much more positive, um, indeed closer to your satisfaction. He called it fulfillment, perhaps, or my translation, having wasted my youth studying Greek and Latin, is that it was doing your best at what you're best at for the sake of others. Doing your best at what you're best at for the sake of others. Because if you're only doing it for yourself, it ends up being pretty pointless, actually. Um, you've got to have a purpose beyond yourself to make life at all satisfying in the end. So I go back to Aristotle. But philosophers, philosophers are clever. That's why I call myself one, because they only ask questions, they never give you answers. <laughs> and when they give you an answer, you think it's fine until it turns out to be a question. So Aristotle says, you know, the good life is doing your best at what you're best at. <laughs> well, what are you best at? <laughs> and how do you know you're doing your best with what you're best at? So it is actually a question. And, and uh, I have to leave you with, with that little thought. Um, what do you think is your best at? Um, but I then want to, to, uh, to show you another line, which is another line of life. Actually, it's a line of everything. It's called a sigmoid curve, the S-shaped curve. And if you think about it, it's true of almost, well, actually of everything. I mean, first of all, think of a product. You invest in it and then it's successful and goes up and then it's overtaken by other products. Or you think of 
Hmm, the British Empire, you know. You put a lot into it and then it goes up and then it goes down. Or, um, I mean, every organization, the average lifetime of a business, as you may or may not know at the moment, is 32 years. How Shell had the effrontery to offer me a 40-year <laughs> life. <laughs> I never quite understood. <laughs> so they're actually, Google and Dutch, they're still 106 years old now, but there are very few centenarian organizations, I have to tell you, so lifelong employment was always a con, um, even when it happened. But also it's true, of course, of you. That dip is education. And then you are very successful, basically. But, but I'm sorry, you know, everything ends. Even the Roman Catholic Church was the time in the end. That's the youngest organization that I know. And, uh, and of course, that's highly depressing. All you have to do is calculate where you are and how long you've got to go before you're over the hump. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, of course, it's quite easy, really. You just draw another line, another curve, and then another one eventually. And that's very easy. Um, except there's a snag. You have to start the first, second curve before the first one peaks so that you've got the time and the resources for the investment of energy and experiment and money to start the second curve, as I keep telling businesses. So it's actually when you're you're feeling very good about yourself, about to peak, but you don't know you're about to peak. You think it's going to go on forever, that you've solved it. You've got the market taped or whatever, or your life taped, but you don't know. I mean, I was traveling in the Wicklow Hills behind the city where I was born, Dublin, not so long ago. And I lost my way because the, the hills, in those days anyway, didn't have many signposts. But then, of course, after a bit, I saw an Irishman by the roadside, so I stopped and I said, can you tell me the way to a voker? And he said, yes, of course, he said. He said, it's very easy. You go on straight up this hill and then down the other side um, for, for, about, for about a mile and a half. And you'll see a bridge over a river, a little bridge, and, and Davy's Bar on the other side. It's painted red. You can't miss it. Have you got that? I said, well, yes, up the hill, down the hill, bridge, Davy's Bar. He said, well, he said, half a mile before you get there, turn right up the hill. <laughs> and you see, this, this is the problem. You only know where you should have turned right up the hill when you passed it. And I've met many, many, many firms, many people at Davy's Bar downing their drinks and saying, oh, it was good while it lasted, wasn't it? But, you know, if only we'd listened, if only we'd, etc. So it is very, very difficult to know. And the only thing I can tell you is that when you're feeling pretty pleased with yourself, in business or with life, that's the time to start thinking. That's why Brendan and I thought it would be quite a good time to you at the peak of your success in life and work, that maybe you should be thinking about the second curve and what it might be while well, you've still got time. This, this gap, it seems to me, is basically two years for business or for individuals. From the time they start thinking, it ought to be a bit different and a bit of experiment, a bit of you know, false starts and so on before you actually overtake the old curve. And if you're in a business, of course, you've got to keep the old curve going or in your own life, you've got to keep the present job going so that you're generating the resources and you've got some time to think about it, to dip your toe into other waters. So, you know, you feel a bit sorry for people who just resign, like old George, what's his name, from the BBC. Though, of course, he's been given a nice cushion for his little <coughs> second curve investment. Um, but, um, so what is going to be the secret of your second curve? This is what's going to be the living time in your life. Hmm? Well, this is my wife Elizabeth here in her kitchen, her self-portrait. Elizabeth, of course, who's wiser than me, says, you talk a lot of nonsense, really, he said, she said, but actually, everybody has at least three separate selves, separate aspects to their life. 
Hmm? I'm seeing you here in your sort of corporate go garb, you know, all very respectable, but there's another bit of each of you, hmm? I bet, at home at the weekend with the children or the wife or the husband or whatever. And there's a third bit of it. I mean, there are bits of you which we never see, which might be quite different. Hmm? And you know them. So what she does, first of all with herself, but then I shall show you with other people, she says to them, I'm going to take, stand still in a, in a space, like this is her kitchen, and, and um, I want you each, your, my subject, to act out your three different selves in the same space. But they, mustn't, they must sort of spread themselves out a bit because I'm going to take lots of different photographs and then join them all together to show you in your three different selves. Hmm? Now, the interesting thing is that when they do that, the bit of themselves that they're most happy with, really, they place nearest to the camera because, I don't know, they, they just do it. And so what, of course, happens then is that aspect of themselves is the largest because it's the nearest to the camera because this is not moving around, you see? So, you know, here is the Elizabeth and, and she's a photographer. And that's what her passion is. I mean, every time she sees another photographer, the conversation goes on forever. Um, that's already happened this evening when she met a photographer here. But then she's also a very competent cook, hmm, mother of two children, four grandchildren, you know, housekeeper, whatever, you know, keeping the place going. And then she's also my business partner, my agent, my business manager. That's her at the back with her computer. You can see how important I am in her life. <laughs> rating somewhat below the camera. <laughs> but it's very interesting. And when we do this, we can get surprised. And people can get surprised. This is a chap called John McLaren. And we, we took him um, a picture for, for a book we did about um, exciting social entrepreneurs and so on. And at the time, he was a banker. It's quite an important banker with Deutsche Morgan Rental. <coughs> you can see what he thought of that. That's him at the back. <laughs> uh, he's back to us in his dark suit. He's also a very talented um, musician, and we, we wanted him in our book because he'd started a, a, a worldwide international competition for classical musicians when the, the finalists were played at the Barbican at the London Symphony Orchestra and so on. And, and it was a very interesting idea. But so that was there, and that was what I thought would be in the front. But we were surprised. We didn't know him terribly well, but we knew him quite well. What was in the front was him as an author, because in his holidays, he would go away every year and write a thriller. And there are a couple of them down there on the bottom right-hand corner. Hmm? And now, he is actually devoting most of his life to his writing and turning his books into films. So it was actually there was a bit of him but certainly we didn't know about it, and I suspect he didn't realize how important it was to himself at that time until he did this little exercise with Elizabeth. So as you contemplate what might happen in your second curve, uh, you might, well, you can't ask Elizabeth, she's far too busy, but you might think about it. <laughs> you think about what clothes you would wear, what, what roles you would act out, and which you would put closest to the camera in your living phase, hmm? in your second curve, or maybe your third curve. And it gives you interesting things to think about. But actually, my, my recommendation is that you think of yourself as a portfolio. And it's, a, it's a phrase I coined, coined long, long ago, and uh, I was really partly trying to explain what I did. Uh, because I, I was a thing called a warden of St. George's House, which is a study centre in Windsor Castle, and I left it at the age of 49. And a friend of, me, friend of mine said, uh, well, how are you going to describe yourself? You can't go on being past warden of St. George's House. It didn't mean anything to anybody anyway, but a past or former warden means even less. And I find myself saying, well, I'm going to be a portfolio person, by which I meant that I was going to have a collection of different bits of work. Hmm? Uh, mostly I would be writing, but hopefully I would also be earning a bit of money by 
money in seminars and businesses or something, and, and doing a bit of teaching at the London Business School and so on. So I had a collection, and it's, but it, you know, it seemed smart to call it a portfolio. And gradually it caught on, and lots of people now have portfolio careers, as, as, as they've begun to be called. Um, and, uh, and I should think that probably some of you might want to do that. But then I went on to say, well, actually, it's much more interesting than just a collection of little bits of business to make some money. Um, I think that there are, that actually in the living phase, but even in, throughout life, you should have five sorts of work. I think work is absolutely essential to life because it actually means you're useful, you're contributing in some way. And that's why unemployment is such hell. You know? And work carries, whether it's paid work or unpaid work, carries responsibility. Uh, and that's important. That makes you feel necessary. You, know? you have no work. Now, but there are different sorts of work. There is paid work, which you're all doing. Obviously very well paid, like you. Uh, but, but there's also gift work the stuff you do for free in the community, which is often more satisfying than the stuff you do for money, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's what I call homework, which isn't you know, preparing for the lessons, but it's actually helping out in the home. Child care, parent care, grandparent care, cooking, um, washing, cleaning the house, whatever. We all do a bit of it. We could do a little more, but it's work. There is also what I call study work, because you ought to be learning all the time something, not necessarily to do with your work, but it, you know, and it's not necessarily going on courses, but in one way or another, exploring new worlds, travel could be work, learning new activities, learning to play bridge, uh, I don't know, whatever, but, but learning. If you're not learning, you're not improving, you're not growing. So you have to be working, and it has to be serious. And lastly, there is fun work, but, but, but fun should be work. Whether it's golf or gardening or globe shopping, it, it should be serious. It should be well done. If it isn't done seriously and done well, it isn't worth doing, I think. So other people say <laughs> uh, the, the opposite. But I personally think that if you're going to take up anything for fun, you should do it seriously, which is a paradox, but I think it's worth it. So there are these five aspects of your portfolio which you go through life. Now, the interesting thing is it changes. You know, the percentages of each change as you go through life. So at a certain point, you know, you're really quite busy with the paid work. But then as you move on, and particularly when you get into this third age, you will find that the, the balance changes much more. I now do most of the cooking, which I actually love, but I pretend it's a chore. But, uh, I really like it. And it's a deeply satisfying thing to do because you, you get instant feedback. And, and it's always favorable because it's rude to say this stuff stinks. <laughs> <laughs> so I can't think of anything more pleasurable, actually, as a form of work. But it's also fun. Um, but of course, you can, you can do other things. Uh, I, I, you know, and, uh, there's some, I mean, work is, paid work is probably going to be essential unless you're very, very fortunate in your current employer or whatever, but most people, I mean, because neither governments nor individuals ever anticipated having 20 years extra at the end of their working life, nobody's really planned for it properly. And some people, of course, are, are, some of my friends are on final salary pension schemes, and lucky them, but, but it won't apply much longer for anybody. And uh, you'll only get back what you put in. And then, of course, we will start putting in things much too late and so on. So you will probably want to, and should do anyway, for emotional reasons, want to do some paid work in that living age. And there are various sorts of things you can do. Um, this, is an, this is an elephant, <laughs> and a, meant to be a flea on top of this. It's a little ornament that was given to me in Africa when I was talking about this. Um, and because, because I wrote a book about the elephant and the flea. Um, in which I was suggesting, actually, that uh, uh, we need big organizations because they are the elephants that you know, trample down the jungle and, and, and carry us forward. But, but, but elephants need fleas or they, or they, they get a bit sort of staid. And, uh, and, and, um, 
these are parasitic. They live on Earth, the elephants, but they are independent things. And all, all innovation, all creativity comes from fleas, individuals or tiny organizations. And I'm arguing that um, uh, nowadays in life, because of technology and because so much of our work is actually knowledge-based, um, the elephants can, can actually sort of um, maximize the ideas of, of, the, of the fleas. But we need the fleas. And quite honestly, as you get older and you move from energy into wisdom, you might well be interested in, in being a flea, perching on the back of an elephant, delivering your wisdom and expertise that you have without having to actually be employed, which is probably becoming a bit of a chore, even if you're the boss. Um, and as a friend, an advertising agency said to a friend of mine, he said, John, John, you, we, we desperately need your wisdom and your contacts and your experience. But John, <coughs> only on Tuesdays, please, and we, we won't give you an office. <coughs> and and that's, that's a flea existence, no office on Tuesdays only. But, but it's quite freeing and it's quite useful. So there's something special that you have, which is your experience and your wisdom, even if your energy is getting a bit tired and you don't want to go on all those flights 24-7, etc which you give back to your elephant, or find another elephant. Um, but you see, this is me in my study, scratching my head. Elizabeth has given me three arms, um, and I'm usually as bronzed as that, because that's, uh, that's the, the color that's come out on the, on the, um, on the slide. And uh, basically, I'm pondering, and I'm thinking, and I'm writing, and uh, I'm actually a flea. Now, it's very interesting. Um, I write books, as Brennan said, and uh, um, I like to say that Elizabeth and me, because she's my business partner, she actually organizes things, that we jointly produce or manufacture in 12 different countries. We market in 20, and uh, you know we distribute, have sold two million odd books around the world. But of course, we haven't done it alone. We couldn't have done it without a great couple of elephants called Ele Random House and Penguin, whom I'm delighted to see are now married. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, uh, the interesting thing is that they never employed me, and I wouldn't have wanted to be employed by them. And if you think about it, all of their intellectual property is provided by self-employed people who are not employed by them which is very odd when you think about it, to put your intellectual property outside and just pay the, by results, which is the way I'm paid. But actually, I do think it's a model that we're going to see more of, because so much of the intellectual property of an organization can be contained and held by a small number of people. And I think, increasingly, they're going to say, I'm not going to give this to you just in return for a salary. I want to be paid you know, according to the royalties, as it were, what you make out of my intellectual property, and we're going to set up independently. Hmm? And uh, we'll negotiate on ourselves. Do you think John Humphreys is paid by the BBC? No, he is not. No, he's a self-employed person, as most of them are. Um, and, and more and more, I think, I think business, traditional business, hasn't caught on to this, the way that, you know, newspapers, all people who deal with knowledge and information, basically, are elephants surrounded by fleas. Um, and uh, you may want to be a flea once you leave your elephant. Um, um, or uh, you can go on doing what you used to do. This is an architect. And he used to work, he used to work as a very big firm in, in, in London. And he now lives in, quite near us in, the, in East Anglia. And um, he works on his own. Um, he no longer builds you know, skyscrapers, great big office buildings. He, he does uh, conservatories or cottages and things like that, but he's terribly happy. Uh, he has no bosses. Um, he has no subordinates. He is himself and his wife having a ball, drawing a game instead of doing things on computers. So you can do what you used to do, only smaller and more spasmodically in a way. Or you could do what um, um, this chap, Peter Ryan, does. We're, we're off to Malawi next week <coughs> to, to uh, photograph, document with Elizabeth um, a, a micro operation out there, which this, this chap started. He, he was a, an executive for a French food company, and um, he, he, um, he heard a, a talk about uh, the micro world, uh, you know, 
Bishop's staff in Bangladesh, which, and, and decided he would do it himself in Malawi, a, company, a country he knew little about, had been there. It was the poorest country in the world, probably, possibly also one of the most beautiful, I believe, we will tell you next week. And he started up on his own. He, did, he was just a salary guy, but he, he managed to raise 25,000 pounds and he went off and started lending it to women, and he got bigger and bigger, and now, well, we're going to see, but it's quite a big operation with training centers and so on. So he decided that his work would be sort of kept with, because he now gets a, pays himself a small salary. But, but he's so happy to have to do it. He's found something that he can do which enlivens the lives of others, and it's very exciting. But it's not the whole of his life, of course. He, he has a family and other things. In fact, what I'm going to suggest to you is that you should live your life on the donut principle. Uh, it's an English donut with a jam in the middle. Um, diagrammatically, it looks something like that. <laughs> now, I think what I'm trying to say that in, in what I have found anyway, in my experience of living over the third age of the living bit, is that you have to have a core function in your life, something that defines you mainly, so that you, when people say, who are you, what are you? You have some, there's a bit of you that's going to be nearest Elizabeth's camera. So I am a writer. I do other things. I cook. I cook and, you know, and so on. But I am a writer, first and foremost, I say. Um, and I think that helps. Now, but, but it's not the whole of the donut. There are other things there. The problem is, if the core is the whole of the donut, which it often is when you're working full time in the middle of your career, then you are a very boring person. Because you can only talk about work. I mean, you know, but when, when I was helping to start the London Business School and, and it was a, you know, any startup, it's very exciting and very involving. And I was there all day and all, most of the night, and, you know, talking up the students and, you know, preparing classes and so on. And after about five years, my, my dear wife said to me, how's the school doing? And I said, well, it's early days. It's the first business school, proper business school in Europe. And, you know, it's struggling, but I think it's on the way. I think we're making it. And she said, I'm so happy for you. She said, I just think you should go. You've become the most boring man I've ever <laughs> met. So I had to resign, didn't I? But, um, um, but that's the problem. It shouldn't be so dominating that there isn't other riches. And the, the glory of the third age, of the living part of your life, is that there is a full donut. And it's not all core. There are all sorts of other things. So. You know, interesting people have at least three business cards. <laughs> and they say, which, which me would you like? Here you are, here you are. And I think that's, that's the exciting thing. And uh, just finally, and then I, I will, I'll stop. And, um, uh, it's, it's, it's my age, but we, we go to a sort of funeral a fortnight now. <laughs> 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 and it's interesting. I mean, funerals are much better than weddings because you know more people. <laughs> 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 and you know, you know, things to talk about. Uh, and you know, if it's, if it's a ripe old age, it's not. It's not. It's, it's sad, but it's, it's also a celebration of a guy's life. And and the people give a eulogy, of course. And I, and and of course, what's so interesting. You know, here's somebody who's died at 84 or something. Because um, you're, you're all going to die at 80, 84.6 years or something. Um, they, they, you know, what he or she did in the mainstream of life, ending up as marketing manager of Doodlebug and Co., you know, it's sort of glossed over. I mean, it's, it's, it's mentioned, but it doesn't seem important anymore somehow. And what co comes out is other things that he was such a gifted pianist, he could sit down at a party and, you know, and play anything you asked him, and we never knew because he was a straight laced old bastard most of the time, but then you could, uh, and you hear about aspects of him that often you didn't see or didn't know, but the people who really knew him loved him. him. And, were, and, and that was how he was going to be remembered, not for his CV, not for his CV, but for the other bits of the donor, interestingly so often. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was saying to Brendan the other day that uh, in our country place in East Anglia, somebody said to me, you must meet Barry. He said, he, he's had, 
you know, he's a most interesting guy, you know, and now he's retired, he's living here, and, and you know, you really ought to get to know him. And I said, what did he used to do? And this chap looked at me and he said, oh, I, I have no idea, he said, does it matter? <laughs> and, and of course, in a sense, it, it, it doesn't matter it's who he is now, but all, it was formed, of course, by all that he did do, which helped to make him the person he was, but, you know, that was gone now, when you're in your 70s or whatever. Um, so what sort of man, woman, will you be remembered as by those who loved you most becomes the interesting question. And I have asked, on occasion, groups of people to imagine their death and to write the 200-word eulogy that they would love their best friend to say about them, which is a very difficult and interesting thing to do. I wouldn't dream of asking you to do that, but it would be interesting to reflect what sort of things would you like to be remembered for. I, I, I have a, 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 I've written a letter to each of my children to be opened after I die in which I say what I have hoped that they would remember me for and what I hope for them in their life to come. And I, I rewrite it every couple of years because I change as I mature somehow. And uh, I want, but, but all the things I did, helping to start the London Business School or whatever, no, they don't get mentioned, you know. It wasn't important in the end. That was just a CV, which went into making the me that is me. But what is the me is the interesting telling. And that's what makes the living bit of life so incredibly exciting, I find, because one is, one is just, I don't know, exploring oneself in a way that is unconstrained by your duties to your employer or your business or whatever is the, the most exciting time of life. It is wonderful to be old, I have to tell you. I'm going to stop. I'm going to ask you now to turn to your neighbors and just for the next three minutes to say, is there one thing you agreed with, <laughs> one thing that interested you, and one thing you think was a load of rubbish? <laughs> Um, and I'm not going to ask you to feed back. I just want you to have a buzz. <laughs> uh, just to say to you, just to let your lungs get a bit more exercise, and then you can ask me any questions that you want to. So, buzz. Um, questions, uh, comments, stories, anything. Uh, you tell me, I, I will repeat it just so that everybody can hear. So who would like to share something or raise a question? Or? Um, I, I was just thinking the transition from the working life into the living life, or I actually think of it as the creative life in a, in a way, that can be quite scary, I suspect, because you're quite constrained in your working life in a way. I mean, it, it depends what your risk appetite is. Um, and then you, and then you kind of got to discover this, these, these additional faces of who you are and who you might be. And I just wonder, I just um, speculate whether or not that, that could be a rewarding and a scary place at the same time. Absolutely. This, this is the transition that you all hear, the transition from the working life to the living life. Um, it's, it's a bit scary and exciting. I, it is indeed. Um, I mean, the first thing that happened to me uh, was that nothing came into the in-tray. You know, when you're in work, you're actually reacting a lot of the time to the telephone, to committee meetings, to somebody else's agenda, to things coming into the in-tray. In fact, I remember in the early days of management training, you used to give people the in-tray exercise as if that was, that was what managing was all about, dealing with your intray. Well, but the funny thing is, when you move out of the organization, nothing comes in except the FT or something. And, and, and you realize you've got to proact. You have to pick up the phone if you want anything to happen. 
you have to decide, as you said, which bit of you you want to concentrate on. And uh, it's a bit frightening. And then you realize, how stupid you've been all this time, just dealing with the intro, which you have to do. And, and, and it's very, very exciting. Um, not everybody is very good at it. I mean, I'm not very good at it. Luckily, I've married Elizabeth, who turns out to be brilliant at picking up the phone and, and, and suggesting things and initiating things, uh, which I then had to deliver. Um, and <laughs> so she sets me targets and gates. So she says, she says, when we, we started looking at small business in England, and she says, let's look at a microloan operation. And I said, wait, I don't know how to do that. She said, we know Peter Ryan. So she rings Peter Ryan, and Peter Ryan says, yes, yes, come to Malawi, document it, bring it back, we'll make a, you know, and we'll raise money with your booklet we'll make for an exhibition. And, oh, I, I, but I mean, you need to, to think like that, and it's, it, it is exciting and scary at the same time. Did you find that you had to recalibrate what your sense of your value was? Oh, oh, absolutely, yes. Uh, um, turns out to be either, in my case, learning is an essential ingredient. Elizabeth says to me, what are you going to learn from talking to these people? Yeah. Uh, and, and I say, well, I've never done this before. I never talked to people at the height of their working life about the next phase. You know? And that's very interesting in learning for me. And I'm learning I've learned from talking to Brendan. So that's a bit. But, but the other thing is making a difference. You know, the, 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 I don't want to do anything that doesn't, in a sense, make a difference to somebody. Otherwise, you know, what, what's, what's it all about? But thank you for that. Anybody else? Reflection on your S curve, if I may. Um, yeah. I was fortunate enough to be able to retire at 40, at least I thought I was, because I ran a business that was successful. Um, I thought I'd spend time with my children as they grew up and help them. Within weeks of being at home, my wife pointed out that she was the chief executive officer of the house, not me, um, and that I was not welcome, <laughs> and that I was contributing nothing, apart from opinion, which of course was of limited value. So I started again with my own version and started another S curve. And I think it's about to happen again, so I'm slightly worried about this, because I think she's about to tell me it's no good at me stopping because I'm going to interfere with her life again. So <laughs> there are lots of external influences which it's so easy to ignore. Yes. Were you happy in the middle of that story? I think she was doing a much better job than I was. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wasn't. Were you happier? Were you happier? Was, way, was work an escape from something? I, I, I just would hate to stop working. I mean, but was it the same sort of work? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but you could sell something very different. Well, no, I, no, it, it's an elephant in the pleated, so I, I then went and joined Accenture and became a partner there, and you know, I've left them, and I'm doing the same thing all over again. It's kind of... oh, well, it's going to be exciting <laughs> when you do something yeah. not the same thing all over again. Isn't it? So yeah. I think the answer is you just keep on doing Oh, yes, it. well, if you saw my... Seriously. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But it's not under your control. Other people are actually selling you what well, what, the, what they tend to do, what I find they tend to do, is they tend to, to trigger you when you know you're, you're getting to that peak. Yeah, like Elizabeth getting bored with me and, you know, and, um, uh, you know, that's, that's a trigger. So that you, if you look back at your life, they're usually triggers that force the change. I was doing very well in Shell, by the way, um, until they posted me or wanted me to go and run a bit of West Africa. And, and Elizabeth didn't want to go there. And she said, I cannot believe I've married a man who's sold his life to people he's never met, who are going to tell him where to go and what to do and what success means. <laughs> and I'm certainly not going to stay married to a man like that. <laughs> so it was Shell or Elizabeth. So guess who's here? Um, so, you know, so that was a trigger. And, and so I walked out in the cold. <coughs> <laughs> uh, Charles has kindly offered to book sit on the chairs to sign them so if, if you'd like to 
sign Chelsea, we'd be happy to be there. And you've managed to challenge and inspire us at the same time, Charles. Well done. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much.